Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Hilbolt, Director of Lectures and Seminars here at the Heritage Foundation. It's my privilege to welcome you to our Lehrman Auditorium and to welcome those joining us via our Heritage.org website. We also ask this one last time that everyone in-house do that courtesy check of cell phones and pagers that we often forget to have them turned off uh, so we have no unnecessary interruptions. Hosting our program this afternoon is Michael Frank. Mr. Frank is Heritage's Vice President for Government Relations. Mike. Thank you, John, and good afternoon and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we're he honored today to have Congressman Roy Blunt, the uh, House Majority Whip, here to talk about the new way forward, refocusing the uh, conservative agenda in the wake of what happened on Tuesday. And as you can imagine, quite a few people have been ruminating about what comes next for conservatives and what the election means for conservative principles, like low taxes, limited government, and strong national defense. Our speaker today, House Majority Whip Roy Blunt, just got reelected to serve in his sixth term in the House with 67 percent of the vote from his district in Missouri. He uh, ascended to the position of Majority Whip, the third highest job in the House, in, a, in record time, indicating he was, he's on a meteoric rise in the House. He's responsible for corralling the votes to help enact the Republican uh, agenda in the House. He, um, before coming to serve in Congress, he served as a Republican Secretary of State of Missouri. He uh, was the president of his alma mater, Southwest Baptist University in Bolivar, Missouri. He also serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And we're delighted to have him here today to discuss what might come next uh, for conservatives and conservatism. Congressman, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thanks to the Heritage Foundation. I'm pleased to be here. You know, there is a uh, supposedly true story about a uh, golf course that was built in India over 100 years ago by the uh, British uh, occupiers of India at the time, a fairly remote, pretty tranquil part of India, not a lot to do. So they focused for months on building this wonderful golf course, cutting this golf course out of the jungle. They were so excited uh, when they got it done and uh, went out to play golf the first time. And from almost the first ball that was hit, they developed a very big problem, and that was the monkeys from the jungle would run out and pick up the golf balls and throw them. And sometimes they'd get your ball and throw it back at you. Sometimes they'd take your ball in the fairway and throw it in the rough. Sometimes you'd hit your ball in the rough, and they'd throw it in the fairway. Clearly not part of the game. So they tried every way they could think of to get rid of the monkeys, ways that we won't even describe here today, uh, in cannons, capturing the monkeys. They could never get rid of the monkeys. And so finally they developed a rule that was, as far as I know, the rule for only this golf course. And the rule for this golf course was you have to play the ball where the monkey throws it. Um, and not a bad rule for life to understand that you have to do exactly that and you have to deal with the circumstances you find. Uh, we're going to see a lot of people over the next two, several days trying to, just, to uh, identify what happened? In fact, it's uh, said that success has a thousand fathers and failure's an orphan, but uh, just this week we've seen lots of people working to try to analyze what happened on Tuesday, why we had the setbacks we had on Tuesday, and who should take the responsibility. According to some, it's a repudiation of conservatism. Others argue it was the Foley factor. Others a referendum on the war in Iraq. Others are rebuked to one-party rule, while still others say it's a punishment by the faithful for conservatives uh, not staying absolutely true uh, to their principles. Uh, in reality, there was no single explanation for the loss of our majorities. Different candidates lost for different reasons. But as conservatives, we should take this opportunity to reflect on how we govern, honestly uh, assess our shortcomings, and propose the best way to move forward. As conservatives, it's our duty to make this assessment, not because we want to place blame, but because we know that in politics, just as there are no permanent victories, there are no permanent defeats. Uh, 1964, 1976, 1992 required a time for regrouping, for reorganizing, for rededication for conservatives. Uh, 2006 can be just as important and just as positive a time for us to do that. 
An honest assessment of the last few years of Republican government in Washington uh, reveals three distinct shortcomings. First, as the party in charge of most of the last six years, we've often become defenders rather than challengers of business as usual. Second, we've failed to create a culture of less but better government and too often have given in to the culture of spending that's so pervasive in Washington. Finally, we've allowed our efforts to defend traditional values to be defined as little more than politically driven efforts to appease family groups. These disappointments combined with a seemingly constant stream of ethics issues affecting a few members of Congress caused some of our movement to lose faith. The good news is that even with these shortcomings, low presidential approval num numbers, an uncertainty about Iraq, our candidates saw, even with all those things happening, their ideas clearly taking hold in the final days of their campaigns. A shift of 78,000 votes in the entire country uh, would have changed the outcome. Our ideas didn't get beat. In fact, we did. And we have to look at what's uh, good about our ideas and what was wrong with us. We don't want to become, again, the defenders of business as usual. Uh, we want to be continuing to focus on less but better government, government that does what the federal government is supposed to do and does it effectively. And we want to put values above politics. Before turning to those three things, which I want to talk about primarily today, let me speak for a moment about the ethical challenges we've uh, confronted. Neither the Republicans uh, nor the Democrats, neither liberals nor conservatives, uh, are immune from having bad actors in their midst. In fact, in all walks of life, a few individuals in all walks of life from all parts of the political uh, spectrum are always prepared to create problems to engage in unethical activity and immoral activity, even in illegal activity. It doesn't matter whether you're in the Congress. Uh, whether you're in education, whether you're in the church, whether you're in the private business, uh, we have those things that happen. A test, however, of all of those organizations and a test of a political movement uh, is how it responds when confronted with these individuals. Lawmakers all too often respond by doing what we do best, thinking you can solve these problems by passing new laws or creating new rules. The truth is that no amount of law or rulemaking will cause all people to behave well all of the time. Before 1994, when conservatives were out of power uh, and were unable to make new rules or to pass new laws, we recognized this truth and confronted serious legal and ethical violations by, by declaring that those who were part of them had no place in our movement. I suggest we need to recommit ourselves to that standard. For conservatives, holding on to or gaining political power should never become come before our obligation to be worthy of people's trust. The other failures I want to talk about today are not meant to discount the progress we have made because it's been substantial. We've made tremendous gains in our tax policies, for example, reducing taxes on both income and investments and promoting economic growth. Uh, the economic numbers that Americans enjoy right now are significant, and one of the great things in the polling at the end of this last campaign was Americans were really beginning to look at the economy and appreciate what these policies had done to grow that economy. We've enacted multiple lawsuit abuse reform bills, curbing class action lawsuits, protecting some manufacturers from frivolous lawsuits, and we've begun the tremendous task of securing our borders. In fact, the strong economy and our efforts to defend the country are both proof of the difference between us and them. My comments are merely acknowledgment that our performance has fallen short of our own expectations. It's not entirely surprising that we would fall short. I used to say I was from the part of uh, Missouri that was so conservative that we believed the federal government uh, should defend the country and deliver the mail. Uh, and after that, we were prepared to debate almost everything else. The truth is we're not quite as committed to that mail delivery thing as we used to be, but we, <laughs> we do still believe the federal government is the only place that can defend the country. And you know that healthy skepticism about government that most conservatives have is one of the reasons that uh, incremental change is so hard for us to accept. Uh, we want to see change and we want to see it immediately, and that skepticism about government drives us to the net, to that immediate result when conservatives first took